biting your nails when you're stressed is just a bad habit. Whoa, this is a good one. I know. Taking a vacation will cure burnout. Big, big myth. Stress is always bad. Can I do this? <laughs> Stress is not always bad. Hi, I'm Stephanie Cook. I am an assistant professor at New York University School of Global Public Health. I seek to understand how things like stigma and discrimination based on race and sexual orientation are associated with mental and physical health. And I'm Teresa Lero. I'm an associate professor in clinical psychology at Rutgers University, and I study the intersection of anxiety, stress, and substance use disorders. And today we'll be debunking myths about stress. A stress-free life is the best life. A stress-free life is definitely not the best life. We need it to survive. Imagine you are out on a hike with your friends and in the pathway ahead, you see a mama bear and her cubs. Immediately, you're gonna start sweating and your heart's gonna start racing really, really hard. This is called a fight or flight response. And this is a stress response. And for these situations, stress is very, very valuable because it helps us as human beings decide, are we gonna fight or are we going to run from the stressor? I also like to think about it as something that can motivate your behavior. When we feel stressed out, we're often going to be motivated to work toward a goal and to work hard toward it. However, over time, when this stress response system is continually triggered and it's prolonged in any way, this can be bad for our health. It opens us up to all kinds of sicknesses and disease associated with poor mental health. Welcome the good stress and do your best to mitigate the bad stress. You should shield kids from stress. This is a good uh, one. <laughs> to all the parents out there who do do this on a regular basis, I feel you, right? However, you're doing a disservice to your child. We often call this helicopter parenting, hovering over them, making sure that all barriers, all dangers are swept to the side. Unfortunately, kids with helicopter parents often develop difficulty with anxiety and self-regulation. We have to learn stress processes and how to handle stress when we're young. So that they can learn to tolerate distress and learn how to self-regulate and develop adaptive coping tools. Make sure that they know that you're there supporting them and to valid and acknowledge the emotions that they're experiencing while allowing them to work through them on their own. We want to raise resilient children. And the way to raise resilient children is really to help them learn how to deal with these experiences at an early age. Oh, I love this one. Uh, Taking a vacation will cure burnout. Big, big, big myth. You're preventing it in the moment. You get back home and all of those feelings of exhaustion and issues are going to return immediately. So burnout is actually a prolonged form Form of stress and exhaustion caused by a variety of stressors. So we're often thinking a combination of a different responsibilities that you don't have the capacity to manage and feel overwhelmed by. The only way to really cure burnout is to remove that aspect of your life where you're burned out, which isn't a possibility for most of us. But as a clinical psychologist, I think of what are kind of the basic emotion regulation mm -hmm. tools that you yeah. can make sure that you are including in your every day. So um, making sure that you are going to bed at a reasonable time, waking up, at a reasonable time, eating relatively healthy and throughout the day, staying away from mood altering substances, mm -hmm. taking prescriptions as prescribed, getting your regular exercise in, and mm -hmm. pleasurable activities. Another strategy to think more critically about is mindfulness or meditation. So really taking time throughout your day to center yourself and breathe. Just try not to think about it. Uh, okay, I have a task for you. Don't think about a pink elephant for the next 30 seconds. All think I'm about doing is anything thinking. at all. <laughs> yeah, okay, so Stephanie already, right? <laughs> Two seconds later, she's like, yep, ding, 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 thinking about a pink elephant. When we try not to think about something, we're actually more likely to then think about it. Mm -hmm. And if you actually think about something in a lot of detail, you can actually kind of bring down the distress associated with it. What I want to know is, is it a 
thought or is it a fact? We call that flexible thinking or cognitive restructuring. Can you actually challenge the thing that you're thinking about? Is there any evidence of it? Can you come up with a more helpful alternative? Or can you at the same time maybe hold two opposing perspectives? So I think what you're saying is we really need to think about the stressor to deal with the stressor. Yeah. Right? In that way, we'll start to feel better about it in some way or we'll start to get some resolution about it. Absolutely. Stress helps people work faster and better. <laughs> <laughs> we all have this moments where we're like, yeah, nailed it, under pressure, got it done, yeah. right? But that's, that's not the norm. That's more the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. When you put people under stress, they're more likely to make silly mistakes that they wouldn't otherwise make, especially if you're working under prolonged stress, this is not going to go well in the long term. When people report that they work better under stress, usually it's actually other factors. So they happen to work better at night or work better in the morning. But they're saying, oh, I think I just work better under stress. It's also really important to think more critically about the working conditions in which you work best in. So do I work better at home? Do I work better at the office? Because the whole idea is to reduce stress and improve the output and the quality of your work. Biting your nails when you're stressed is just a bad habit. It's not just a bad habit. There's a physiological component to it. Nail biters usually bite their nails because they're under aroused, actually, meaning they're really bored, or over arousal. So an over arousal, for example, of the stress system. <laughs> if you like bite your nails a lot, you open yourself up for infections. Yeah. Some of the ways to prevent nail biting, number one, we need to understand the stressor. Can we reduce that stressor in your life? And if so, does that handle the nail biting issues? If the the stressor is constant and chronic, put nail polish on your hands. And then also, you know, in more extreme places, people wear gloves. Alcohol helps you de-stress. Alcohol is something that can alleviate stress initially, but if we think about consistent use over time, it's actually going to increase the likelihood that you develop problems with anxiety and dysregulate your stress system, overall leading to poor physical and mental health outcomes. We really want people to be developing more long-term adaptive techniques to cope with stress. Can we do a quick distraction or game? So if I turn to Stephanie right now and I say, we're gonna go through different types of food. I'm gonna start with the letter A, you go B, and so forth. A, apple. B, banana. C, carrot. The point is that when we do something like that, we become focused in the moment. We're able to maybe add some levity to the situation so that when we're done going through the alphabet, we can choose a more helpful activity. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm gonna go on a run, do some yoga, bake some cookies, call a friend to catch up. Stress is always bad. Can I do this? <laughs> Stress is not always bad. It really depends on the context and our interpretation yeah, yeah. of it. If we're getting ready to walk down the aisle and say I do to somebody for the rest of our lives, we might feel really, really stressed out, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's accompanied by this positive, warm, loving excitement. So stress can actually indicate that you're really, really excited about something. Yeah. Thinking, I can do this, I've got this, this stress is actually gonna help me to perform. It actually allows that our blood pressure to go down a little bit. So our heart is working hard, but it's able to actually get that blood through our body to our brain mm -hmm. where it needs to get. To add on a little to moderate stress, good. Research shows it's good. Think of it as a helpful friend that's going to push you over the finish line. Stress eating is no big deal. <gasps> I'm a big stress eater. Yeah. Confessions. <laughs> But stress eating isn't great for us guys. It's a negative feedback loop. You know, you might have a really stressful day at work and in addition to your lovely glass of red wine, you have half a chocolate cake. You might have immediate relief from your stress. 
you'll then feel bad about eating the chocolate cake. And then you'll feel stressed out about it. And then you might want to eat again. And Have so, the rest of that cake. Exactly. <laughs> Everything in moderation, right? We mm -hmm. are absolutely not yeah. saying to not eat or avoid eating when you're right. stressed. We're just kind of warning about the potential negative effects of it when mm -hmm. it becomes kind of this relied upon mm -hmm. quick fix in the absence of other coping strategies. Mm -hmm. PTSD only affects soldiers and people in war zones. PTSD does not only affect soldiers and people who have lived in war zones. Historically, a lot of the work that we've done to understand trauma and PTSD has been with our armed forces and veterans. The first term for it was shell shock. However, post-traumatic stress disorder can arise based on intimate partner violence or big events like 9-11. We also see post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosed based on things that we might not see as big traumatic events. So for example, experiencing a microaggression. So, you know, a smaller discriminatory event. And it's important to note that the majority of people who experience the trauma won't go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So when we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder diagnostically, we are looking for a few criteria. We want to first establish what the traumatic event is or was. Then we're looking for intrusive or unwanted thoughts about the trauma. They relive the trauma, you know, in terms of nightmares, but also during wakeful hours as well. We're also looking for avoidance. So avoidance of situations that might remind you of the traumatic event. We're also looking for alterations in um, cognition or emotion. So these are changes in the way that we may be think about the world as being safe or unsafe. We might have emotional blunting. It might be difficult to have warm, positive, strong emotions that you used to have. And then we're looking at changes in arousal. Here we might see an exaggerated startle response to something that wouldn't otherwise it'd be alarming or distressing. And so a lot of what people in my field are working on now is trying to structure prevention interventions to address non-military related trauma. Stress is this natural process. It's helped us survive as a species to this point. Identify things that cause you negative or harmful stress in your life and develop adaptive coping tools and make sure that you're also paying attention to ways in which you might be coping in ways that are unhelpful. So stress is not a bad thing, it's important. But if you don't have it, you're gonna get mauled by the bear in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can't get my straight face. <laughs>